Good morning. We welcome you to our service here at Trinity on the second Sunday after Pentecost. We pray that this service will be a blessing to you, that you will grow, be strengthened in your faith, wisdom, and knowledge. Today we follow the order of worship as it begins on page 38, the service of the word. It will also be projected to my right. We begin our service with our first posted hymn. rise. This is the day the Lord has made. We rejoice and are glad in it. If you're following in the hymnal, our order of worship begins on page 38, the service of the word. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and his punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins By the perfect life and the innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
We join our hearts in prayer. O Lord God, you rule over all things in wisdom and kindness. Take away everything that may be harmful and give us whatever is good. We pray this, trusting that you will hear us because of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Our first lesson for this second Sunday after Pentecost, we find in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, reading in the 11th chapter, beginning at verse 18. Here we are reminded that God's word is essential to the spiritual welfare of his people. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates, so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land that the Lord swore to give your forefathers, as many as the days that the heavens are above the earth. See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse, the blessing if you obey the commands of the Lord your God that I am giving you today, the curse if you disobey the commands of the Lord your God and turn from the way that I command you today by following other gods which you have not known. Here ends our Old Testament lesson, the Word of God. Our psalm for today is Psalm 78, found on page 95, if you're following in the hymnal. Psalm 78 will sing the refrain, will join together in the responsive reading of the psalm, and will read the glory be to the Father together. Psalm 78. My people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will utter things from of old. What we have heard and what our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. The Lord decreed statutes for Jacob, and established the law in Israel. So the next generation would know them, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Your word is a lamp to my feet, and a light for my Our second lesson we find recorded in Paul's letter to the Romans. We read in chapter 3, beginning at verse 21. Here, Paul reminds us that we stand righteous, holy, justified, declared, not guilty in God's sight, not by trying to keep the law, but rather through faith in Jesus. But now a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known 
to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. On what principle? On that of observing the law? No, but on that of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Here ends our epistle lesson, the word of God. Alleluia, alleluia. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Alleluia. for the gospel lesson. The holy gospel for today is found in Matthew's gospel. We read in chapter 7 beginning at verse 13. And here Jesus reminds us that faith is only as strong as the truth on which it rests. We hear Jesus speaking in his sermon on the mount. Enter through the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice, is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority, and not as their teachers of the law. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Christ. Please be seated as we sing hymn 490. 
497. Please rise. <clears throat> Grace, mercy, and peace to you from the one true triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we give our attention to the word as found in 1 John chapter 4. We begin reading at verse 16. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. So far God's word. Please be seated. Dear fellow believers in the one true triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Love stories. I suspect there are any number of you who enjoy watching a good love story, be that on a TV show or on the big screen watching a movie. 
or love songs. There are any number of love songs that have been made famous over the years, any number that have been repeated, and perhaps you enjoy listening to those love songs, even joining in at times and singing them to that special someone in your life. When I'm talking about love stories, love songs, I'm not talking about those that are erotic or sex-filled. That's not true love anyway. But I wonder how many of us realize that there are any number of love stories that are found on the pages of Scripture. And as they describe love, remember, it is the agape kind of love. That's true love, that self-sacrificing, that committed love, that forgiving type of love, a love that shows kindness. As we think of love stories in the Bible, we might think of the love that Isaac had for Rebecca, or the love that Joseph showed to Mary. Especially do we think of the love that God has shown to all people. This morning on the basis of the word before us, we are reminded that God's love empowers us to love. We see, first of all, that God is love. And secondly, we are to love. John writes in the second part of verse 16, God is love. That's a very simple statement of fact. And yet it says a great deal more than if John had written God is loving or God is very loving. By simply stating that God is love, John says this is a very part of his essence. A very part of God's being, it is a characteristic, an attribute of God that he is love. Holy, purely, completely love. Now that God is love, sin-blinded human beings would never guess, would never discover on their own. People often wonder, and I suspect you've heard it, how can a kind, loving, caring God uh, allow this or that hardship or tragedy to happen in this world or in a person's life. God is often thought of as, as a harsh, cold, stern, demanding judge and master. Think of Martin Luther. That's how Martin Luther viewed God until he learned otherwise. God is often feared as one who demands perfect obedience and who punishes disobedience. And so since he is feared, he is also often hated. Of course, people get such an idea about God because they look at their own treatment of and by fellow human beings. People don't often deal with each other in a loving and kind way. Even Christians aren't always very loving, kind, forgiving, thoughtful. More often than not, we deal with one another on the basis of what's in it for me? How will I benefit? What can I get out of it? And so many people suppose that if this is how God's creation is, this must be how the Creator is. But John's point here is, get rid of that false notion. That's not God. God is love. And that God is love is so very evident. We think of how God created all things. God created Adam and Eve in his own image, pure and holy. God placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, gave them everything they needed, provided for their every need, preserved them. 
God does the same for us. God creates us. He makes us the unique individuals we are. God not only creates us, but then day by day, He richly and daily preserves us by providing us with all that we need for body and life. But especially do we see God's love in His rescue plan. For we know that while Adam and Eve had it great, they had everything they would ever need, yet they didn't think they did. They thought they needed that fruit from that one tree. And so they rebelled. They disobeyed God. They took of that forbidden fruit. They sinned. They brought corruption, death into this world. And certainly God had every right to wipe them off the face of the planet, to send them directly to hell. But God didn't. God loved them. Made that promise that the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. There was nothing, nothing in Adam and Eve that moved God to react and to act in this way. It was grace, undeserved love, pure and simple, that caused that reaction. And it's love for us, a love that doesn't relax its grip on us. It treats us the same way Adam and Eve were treated. That forgives our sins. Yes, love describes why God was willing to send his very own son to the cross, there to suffer and die. It's God's love that moves him to deal mercifully with us day in and day out. Or just think about it. Put yourself in God's place for just a moment. Wouldn't you tire of having someone wrong you day by day, say they're sorry, forgive them, only to have them do it all over again? But isn't that exactly what God has done for us? Each and every day we sin, and often. And many times we even come back to the same sin again and again. And yet God doesn't give up on us. He doesn't disown us. He, he doesn't throw us from his side. He doesn't send us straight to hell. That's what we deserve for our sin, for our corruption. No, instead, in love, and because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, he forgives us. In fact, our sins are so completely covered, so completely wiped, washed away, that God declares that through faith in Jesus, we are his dearly loved children. God is love. He has loved us, even though we certainly don't deserve it. He's shown that love by creating us, making us the unique individuals we are. By providing us with all that we need for body and life. By forgiving our sins each and every day. As God shows his love to all people, especially to those who are his children through faith in Jesus. God is love. He has loved us. And that calls for a response on our part. As John writes, verse 19, where he makes a second point, we love, we love, because he first loved us. Yes, God's love empowers us to love. God's love for us is the motivating, the pushing force behind our love for Him and for our fellow man. 
As John writes in verse 16, whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. Only by living in love do we show that we live in and for God and that he is really living in us. We are warmed and nourished by God's love for us through the forgiveness of sins. Our love for God will continue to grow and increase as we see all that he has done for us in love. Knowing God's love for us will also lead us to look to the future with confident hope and not fear. As John writes in verse 17, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. Knowing God's love, living in the results of his love for us, which is the forgiveness of sins, living our lives to him in love, leads us to no fear of judgment day. No fear. Because the day of judgment for those who are loved by God and for those who love God is a day of deliverance, a day of peace, a day of joy. The stronger our love for God grows, nourished by His love, the more fear will be crowded out of our hearts and lives. As John points out, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Fear, the dread of punishment, John says, never connected with love. Every Christian who knows by faith that God loves him or her has no fear of God's wrath and punishment since they know beyond any doubt that all of their sins have been washed white. They've been cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. Yes, sin and guilt are buried under God's love. God doesn't hold a grudge. God, God doesn't keep a, a record of all past sins to come back one day and to use them against us. They're not stored away in his memory banks, not at all. They're cleansed, they're, they're washed away, they're forgiven. Judgment Day will only unite the believer with God forever. Death for a believer is simply a summons from this world of sorrows to be with the Lord in his presence forever in the mansions of heaven. And so as children of God, we have nothing to fear. We love because he first loved us. And we show our love to God by our devotion, our service to him, by being faithful managers, stewards of the time, the talent, the treasure, the energies he has given to us, by serving him with all that he has given to us. We show love to God and to our fellow man by sharing the good news of salvation, telling others how God has loved them and what that love means to them and how their sins are forgiven because God has loved them. And yes, we show love to God by obeying his commands, by doing what God wants us to do. And that means living differently from the rest of the world. We love God by loving our fellow man. Remember what Jesus said on Monday, Thursday in the upper room. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. John puts it this way in our text, verses 20 and 21. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So here's the measuring stick to use to see how full our love for God really is or if it's even there. God tells us through the Apostle John, if you don't love your fellow man whom you have seen, how can you love me whom you have not seen? 
His point is clear. We love God, show love to God by loving our fellow man. There are many who would claim, yes, I love my fellow man. Rather, yes, I love God, excuse me, but they hate their fellow man. They're not kind, thoughtful toward them. But notice what God says about such a person who claim that they love him, but really have no love for their fellow man. What does God call them? He's really blunt, isn't he? He says such a person is a liar, that there's really no love there for God. And the reason that love for God can't exist without love for one's fellow man is simply found in what God says here. Whoever loves God must also love his brother, his fellow man. And that may lead us to ask, well, how? How do we show love to our fellow man? Paul helps us understand 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. We might also wonder, is did the expert in the law, well, just who is my neighbor? And in response, you remember Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan. And Jesus' point was that those who show love, kindness, and mercy are those who are acting neighborly. You remember, the Samaritan helped out someone he did not know. He helped out a Jew. In fact, that Jew would have regarded the Samaritan as a, a, an enemy, a hated foreigner. So our neighbor, as Jesus points out, is all our fellow man. Even those we may not particularly get along with very well. Yes, even our enemy. And we're to love them. Just as God has loved us and all people. God is love. Very part of his being. Completely holy love. God has shown his love to us by creating us, making us unique individuals we are. God loves us, shows his love by providing us with all we need for body and life each and every day. God loves us shows his love to us every day by forgiving our sins. God has shown his love to us by preparing a home for us and for all who believe in the mansions of heaven. God's love empowers us to love. And here we are encouraged to be just as loving to him and to others as he has been toward us. My dear friends, may we again see how God's love empowers us to love. And may the Holy Spirit help us to thank God day by day for the great love that he has shown to us. And may we be empowered by that love to love our God and to love others as much as we have been loved. Amen. Please rise. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed, you're following in the hymnal, it's on page 41, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as we gather our thank offerings. As we gather our offerings, we'll join in singing hymn 483. Please rise for prayer. This morning we join together in the responsive prayer of the church. It's found on page 42 in the hymnal. We pray, Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. You have given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptation of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. We thank you for those who teach and preach your saving truth at this place and everywhere. Grant them the rich measure of patience, wisdom, and love. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would shield us from every kind of danger sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Bless our land, our people and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Most gracious God and Father, we came before you with our prayers asking that you would send rain. At times you answer yes, at times no, and at other times you say, wait a while, it's not quite the right time. We thank you that you answered in the affirmative, 
and that you sent precious rain. Help us always to remember that without your blessing, crops cannot grow and food cannot nourish. We ask that you would continue to bless us with rainfall and sunshine in proper measure, that seed time and harvest may preserve us for your service. Make us truly grateful for all the blessings you provide each day as our loving creator. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we also ask that you would bless all earthly fathers as they seek to fulfill the calling you have entrusted to them. Give them loving hearts and sound judgment to exercise godly family leadership. May they daily take to heart your admonition and encouragement to bring up their children in the training and instruction of the Lord. In loving Christian fathers, may children see reflections of you, the Father whose love for us is perfect and complete. And now hear us, Lord, as we also come before you with our private petition. We bring our request before you in the name of Jesus, our Lord, and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and our minds, our time and our skills, our ministries and our offerings, and use them to your glory. We also join together in the prayer our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated as we join in singing hymn 499.
Please rise for prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve your Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and grant you peace. Amen, amen, amen. Please be seated for the closing hymn, hymn 494. Once again, good morning. We welcome all of you to our service here at Trinity today. We'd ask that if there are any visitors, you would sign the guest book, which is found uh, just past the double doors on the back. If you would like more information about Trinity, there are information packets available there by the guest book. Uh, please be sure to take a packet along, or if you have questions, uh, please be sure to ask. Perhaps just a couple of notes and announcements. Next Saturday, divine worship at its regular time at 5 o'clock. Next Sunday, last Sunday of June, divine worship at 9 o'clock. And note that there is a voters meeting that will be following that service to begin about 10, 15 a.m. There is a welcome shower uh, for the new teacher. Um, Private members, you're asked to help out with the Koine weekend as you are able. There was a basketball camp held here this past week at Trinity. A big thank you to all who helped put on that basketball camp. It went well. Then a reminder to save the dates of July 22nd and 23rd. That's the anniversary weekend. 
Koine will be here in concert, and uh, last Sunday you heard the chairman, uh, Mr. Jensted, uh, speak about uh, the many things that were happening on Saturday, as well as the worship service on Sunday. Uh, many volunteers are needed. There are sign-up sheets out on the table if you can help out in some way. Um, so please make sure you look at those sign-up sheets and help as you are able. It is certainly a joy and pleasure for me to be here again to share God's word with you. Certainly pray the service was a blessing to you. May God watch over you today throughout the week, throughout your lives. God's blessings to each and every one of you. Thank you. 